Welcome. My name is Kristen Greenberg, and I am the Assistant Director of the Upper Arlington Historical Society. I have a few colleagues with me here today. Hi, I'm Cindy Halagnak. I'm a trustee with the Upper Arlington Historical Society. And I'm Lee Bracken. I'm a volunteer with the Historical Society and a retired librarian from Northeastern University in Boston. The mission of the Upper Arlington Historical Society is to discover, preserve, and celebrate Upper Arlington's history. We just started this History Speaks event series this year, so thank you for being part of one of our inaugural events. We are so thankful to our lead sponsor, First Merchants Bank, in helping to put this series forward, and our two supporting sponsors, the Veterans Plaza at Malway Park Committee and the Wellington School. Today we'll be taking a virtual walking tour of some of the homes designed by Robert Russell Royce, a noted and prolific architect who created many homes in Upper Arlington between the 1930s and the 1960s. The Upper Arlington Historical Society was the recipient of some of the blueprints of Royce's homes. This gift created a greater awareness of the array of homes Royce designed for the community and eventually led us to create this tour. Because our pre-COVID-19 plan was for a walking tour, the homes that are showcased here today are clustered within a walkable area, but there are many other fine examples of Royce built homes that we could have showcased. Our agenda for today's video is first to give you a grounding of Upper Arlington's development in terms of land uh, to set the context for where and when Royce was designing homes and why this architecture is so important to our community. Next, we're gonna get grounded in Royce himself, who he was before he was an architect, and then later on in our video, a little bit more details about his um, adult life. Lastly, we're going to view over a dozen Royce designed homes. At least one of them was his residence for a while. And we'll talk about their architecture and the people who first owned them. Those who have been on past historical society walking tours know that we have concentrated down in the southern part of our community around Miller Park area. This was the original Upper Arlington development with land purchased in 1913 by King and Ben Thompson from farmer James T. Miller. After its formation and initial development, Upper Arlington grew through many annexations. And you can see some of that pattern by the dates on the map here. This map shows our growth by decade with the colors representing the different decades. It is courtesy of the city and is available for viewing at Northern Park on our history walk. The original development is shown in gray and the development, uh, the annexation in the 1920s is in orange. This tour is going to showcase homes in this area with um, bounded by Lane Avenue to the north, uh, Northwest Boulevard to the east, Guilford Road to the south, and Scioto Country Club to the west. This land was also farmland of James T. Miller. So you need to imagine in the 1920s, this was rolling hills and green space, and then the subsequent building of homes that we'll be looking at today. This red bounded area um, is the Upper Arlington Historic District. The Upper Arlington Historic Society successfully led a campaign to put this region on the National Register of Historic Places in 1985 because of its architecture. Of the over 1,100 mostly residential buildings in the 536 acres of this district, over 900 are considered to be contributing structures representative of the 20th century revival style architecture 
that was popular from 1915 to 1940. Many of the buildings in the district contribute to the unique character of this area. And if this environment was significantly altered, the city would lose its visible historic identity. Many of the homes we'll be viewing today, originally designed by Robert Russell Royce, are contributing structures in this district. In an effort to preserve the city's historic structures while allowing them to be upgraded, City Council adopted legislation in 2009 designed to discourage but not prohibit total demolition. The regulations apply to total or extreme demolition cases that directly affect historical significance of the home. A six month delay period provides an intermission so that alternatives to total dem demolition can be thoughtfully considered. We hope that seeing a photo of the home today and how closely it matches what Robert Russell Royce designed back in the 1930s will help you feel that same sort of thrill for preservation that we do. Let's start our tour with a little background on the architect himself, Robert Russell Royce. Robert Royce was born in 1902 in Stryker, Ohio, in Williams County, located in Northwest Ohio. He attended the Ohio State University. In 1926, Robert Royce graduated with a degree in architecture. And you see the arrow pointing to a young Robert Royce. While at Ohio State University, Robert met Helen Elizabeth Smith. They married in 1928 in Hamilton, Ohio, at which point Helen ceased her formal education. Robert Royce was an accomplished pianist. While in high school and college, he played in several bands, either his own or those organized by others. At one point, he joined the Ted Weems Band, a popular Midwest band which traveled the country between the world wars. Ted Weems and his brother Art sought the most talented college musicians for the group. They played at the inaugural ball of President Warren Harding and gave singer Perry Como his first national exposure. In 1929, the orchestra moved to Chicago. A Discogs listing of orchestra members includes Bob Royce on piano. You see here an ad for the Upper Arlington Company established in 1917 as the developer for our community. Early on, the company managed street development, sewers and water lines. By 1929 and 1930, Robert Royce was in sales at the Upper Arlington Company showing and selling homes. Probably in the late 1920s and early 30s, Royce was in an architectural partnership with E.W. Austin and H.T. Roderick. On their official letterhead, they were known as Austin, Royce, and Roderick, Associate Architects, Columbus, Ohio. After this company dissolved, Robert worked for Curtis Wright at the Columbus Airport. It's uncertain what he did, but perhaps he was in the construction trade. By the early 1930s, Robert was listed as an architect in the city directory. He's listed as a builder in 1932. On July 18, 1930, a son, Robert Richard Royce, was born to Robert and Helen. He later followed in his father's footsteps and became an architect, practicing in the 1960s and 70s. Robert and Helen's daughter, Linda Roma, was born in 1934. She attended Upper Arlington schools and married Robert K. Barton, who was an attorney in the John Bricker Law Firm, where his father was a partner. John Bricker was an Ohio governor from 1939 to 1945, and then U.S. Senator from 1947 to 1959. Robert Royce's architectural career was progressing, and the nature of his work was not strictly residential. 
He was the general contractor and architect of the new Drexel Theater, which opened in Bexley on December 25th, 1937. He was credited with the beauty and convenience of the theater's modern construction. The predominating background colors were cream and light blue enamels, trimmed in genuine stainless materials, which were durable when exposed to the elements. The P.F. Yoger Sign Company was the first firm in Ohio to build complete neon signs. Founded in 1892, the Columbus firm claimed the distinction in building trouble-proof signs of first quality. This booklet, entitled Charm and Architecture, believed to have been published around 1939, is in the Upper Arlington Historical Society archives. The promotional piece documents and celebrates Royce's work in architecture. Photos of Royce homes from the booklet will be included for many of today's tour homes. As the booklet proclaimed, in the past 10 years, 636 homes have been built in Upper Arlington. Over 100 of these homes have been designed by Mr. Royce. The Charm and Architecture booklet also gives us glimpses of the interiors and the original exteriors of some of the homes on this tour. Even today, realtor advertisements such as this Zillow ad from 2019 brag about a home being Royce built. Royce homes are very different from one another, but the Royce attention to detail is a distinguishing attribute. Let's look at some Royce homes in our neighborhood. This first Royce home on our tour is a French Normandy revival style, fashioned after homes in the Norman Normandy province of Northwestern France, where the house and barn were combined into one building. This towered subtype of the Normandy style is immediately identifiable by the presence of a prominent round tower with a high conical roof. The front turret resembles a silo where grain was stored, and in the revival style home, it serves as the entrance. These houses have tall, steeply pitched roofs, many of which are hip roofs, although this example is not. This home designed by Robert R. Royce was built in 1932-1933. Thanks to the Charm and archi Architecture booklet, we can see how this home looked upon construction. According to the city directory, Robert and his wife Helen lived at this address for one year in 1932 upon its completion. The Royces sold the property to Earl and Anna Baldwin in 1936, according to the Franklin County Auditor. Earl S. Baldwin was assistant general agent of the Columbus branch of the Osborne Division of the International Harvester Company, located at 470 to 478 North Front Street. Established in December 1902, the branch territory covered all of Ohio and employed more than 60 people. It handled a full line of harvesting machinery, including binders, mowers, and reapers. Earl S. Baldwin started with the company in 1896 and came to Columbus in 1897. He was well known in the implement trade. Thanks to the Charm and Architecture booklet, we can provide some interior photos of the home as it looked around 1939. The second Royce home is of English Tudor revival style. Some of you might be thinking, that doesn't look like English Tudor revival to me. While the home does not contain the trademark Tudor decorative woodwork, it is so classified because of the strong gabled aspects in the stone facade. The home also has some trademark Royce elements. Common in Royce designs is the rounded motif as seen in the window above the door. Also common in Royce designs are the windows that extend above the roof line 
in a faux dormer fashion. Note the detailing in the door framing as well. English Tudor Revival was a common style of suburban homes in much of the United States in the early 20th century. Only the colonial revival rivaled it in popularity. This home was built in 1935. Note the awnings on the home in the 1930s. Our research indicates that William V. and Helen S. Miller lived in this home. William Victor Miller worked for the state of Ohio. He was a veteran of both World War I and II. He served in various fraternal organizations. His wife Helen died in 1964. He remarried and was survived by his second wife, Elsie, at his death in 1977 when he still lived at this address. So when the Millers were relaxing by this fireplace in 1935, there was a streetcar that stopped nearby at the corner of Parkway and Coventry. It then proceeded south to Miller Park and on to downtown Columbus by way of Fifth Avenue. This accessibility was a significant point in marketing brochures for the Upper Arlington community. People could live farther from work without owning a car. Hopefully the Millers were not enamored with the streetcar because on March 22, 1936, the Arlington line was shut down and replaced with bus service. The convenience and affordability of the automobile caused the streetcar's decline. This beautiful cottage is of the Cotswold Cottage Revival style. The style is marked by its asymmetry and the prominent stone chimney located in the front of the house. Note how large the chimney is in relation to the overall size of the house. The gable roof is steep and there are arched doorways. Brick, stone, stucco, or half timbering are used as siding for Cotswold Cottage Revival homes. Often the Cotswold is called a storybook style. What are some of the Royce aspects of this house? Note the ironwork on the chimney. This time, it is an anchor. This nautical theme is reflected in many Royce features, including round windows that allude to portholes and barrel ceiling closets. Looking at this home, as it was featured in the Charm and Architecture booklet of 1939, you can see that the current bay window was a later addition to the home. This cottage was the home of Anthony John and Maud Nelson. Anthony Nelson, an immigrant from France, uh, excuse me, from Greece, co-owned with William Petrakis two restaurants in Columbus the York Grill, and later the QCB restaurant at 7 South High Street. Nelson and Petrakis had been in the restaurant business together in Columbus since 1918. Maud Nelson died in 1950. Anthony Nelson and his second wife lived in Worthington during the 1950s. He was very active in the Greek community. He died in 1956. There are several Royce homes in the Between the Parks neighborhood. Those blocks between Nicholas and Westover Parks bounded to the east and west by Coventry and Tremont Roads. While this home is best classified as Colonial Revival or Salt Box, one would never find a true 18th or 19th century home with the embellishments this house contains. This home has a front gable added to what would otherwise be a relatively typical colonial revival home. Again, note the windows that extend above the eaves in a faux dormer style and note the decorative ironwork on the chimney. When built as seen here, this was the home of Dr. Ralph Licklider. In 1940, three osteopathic doctors Ralph S. Licklider, Harold E. Clyborne, and James O. Watson purchased the former Radium 
Hospital, an open doctor's hospital at 1087 Denison Avenue. These three doctors, along with Dr. Frank Watson, were known as the Four Horsemen, who were leaders in their profession, according to Dr. T. C. McDaniel in his book, Disease Reprieve, Living into the Golden Years, published in 1999. Dr. McDaniel wrote, these giants gave us a profession. Charm in architecture gives us a peek inside the home in its early years. Another Roy's home in the neighborhood is in the classic English Tudor revival style. The facade is dominated by two prominent gables that are steeply pitched, as well as a gabled dormer. There's decorative half timbering, which is present on about half of Tudor homes. Note also the stylized timbers framing the screen porch, the kind of attention to detail common in Royce homes. Except for the awnings, the home doesn't look much different today from how it looked in the 1930s. This was the home of William and Ethel Young. William Young was the director of operations at the Capital Finance Corporation in Columbus. Begun in 1920, the company was in the small loan business and by 1941, it had expanded to 77 offices in nine states. Its headquarters was in the Buckeye Building at 42 East Gay Street. William Young was a member of many fraternal organizations. In addition, he was past president of the American Association of Personal Finance Companies. He died in 1970 and is buried in Baltimore, Maryland. Our next Royce home is not particularly distinctive in style, but we can classify it as primarily colonial revival. Built in 1940, the front of the house is Tudoresque due to its front gabled roof. The inset dormers appear to mimic some Tudor roof styles also. Try and picture what this house would look like without the front entry section. It would look like a colonial revival home. Royce probably tried to improve the simple colonial design by adding the gable and the dormer window embellishments. We heard earlier about the popularity of the colonial revival style in the early 1900s. In fact, the majority of homes south of Lane Avenue built from the 1920s through the 1940s, which feature a side gabled roof and a relatively plain facade are colonial revival. Ellsworth G. and Beatrice Greiner bought this house in 1941. He was the owner of the well-known shoe store, Evans and Schwartz, at 479 North High Street near North Market. He was formerly from Delaware and operated the shoe business in Columbus for 22 years, succeeding his father-in-law, Frank R. Evans. Unfortunately, he was one of four men, three from Columbus and one from Licking County, who died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds over one weekend in July 1945. His wife Beatrice became president of the company and by November of 1964, a seventh store was opened at Lane Avenue Shopping Center. A grand Royce home is the English country revival home seen here. These imposing looking stone houses, sometimes referred to as Cotswold style, are closely associated with the Tudor style. They are usually two or two and a half stories with steeply pitched gabled roofs. It's not uncommon for these houses to have sl roof slates that are placed with greatest exposure low on the roof area and becoming narrower as the rows of slates reach up toward the roof ridge line. In doing so, the slates help to add an optical illusion that the roof area is larger and steeper than it is. These homes have leaded glass and multiple chimneys, which may be topped with terracotta chimney pots. This early Royce home built in 1934 
belonged to William Henry Iveson Tate and his wife Blanche Tate. They lived here for 10 years. William Tate was born in Hot Springs, Arkansas. By 1920, when he was 48 years old, he and his first wife, Annie, moved from Hot Springs to Columbus. In 1925, Annie died and was buried in Hot Springs. In 1928, William married his second wife, Blanche, in Athens, Ohio. William Tate was well known in Columbus sales with the Todd Protective Check Writing Company, a check writing machine business. He was also prominent in masonry. He worked until the, until the time of his unexpected death from a heart ailment in 1942 at 71 years old. He is buried in Arkansas. This smaller home might be described as French Normandy Revival meets Cape Cod. Built in 1951, this home is a modest version of the French Normandy Revival style homes built by Royce. This home belonged to James J. and Maud E. Quilligan. James Quilligan was an inventor and executive with M and R Dietetic Laboratories, the forerunner of Ross Laboratories and now part of the conglomerate Abbott Laboratories. He and Herbert Odding of Westerville received a patent on an invention relating to ice cream and other frozen food products containing a high percentage of milk solids, not fat, which was common back then, and a method for manufacture. Their patent application was filed in 1939 and approved in 1941. The company started in 1903 as Moore's and Ross Milk Company, and by 1925, created a new infant formula, which eventually was called Similac. In 1956, the company created Ross Laboratories to continue its experimentation with improvements in infant formulas and also became an expert on infant care. Ross Laboratories merged with Chicago-based Abbott Laboratories in 1964. Maud Ryan was the second wife of James Quilligan. He died in August 1963 in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Here is another classic English Tudor revival home designed by Robert Royce. Note the characteristic decorative timbers and front gable. Earlier, we saw a house on Westover Road that Ellsworth G. and Beatrice Griner occupied. In 1935, before they lived nearby on Westover Road, they lived in this home. Four years later, they sold this property to Beatrice's mother, Blanche C. Evans. Blanche was married to Frank Evans, who died in September 1934 at the age of 51 of septicemia, an infection of the bloodstream. Beginning in 1922, he was a building contractor, but then for 30 years, he was with Evans and Schwartz, a company that began in 1888. His widow Blanche lived at this home in 1940 and 1941, while her daughter and son-in-law, Ellsworth and Beatrice lived nearby. And with this home, Royce does some unexpected things. The decorative timbers and front gable of this home shout English Tudor Revival style, but the hip roof is not common for the style. Note the windows that extend above the eaves in a faux dormal, dormer fashion and the Oriel window above the center arch door entrance. What is an Oriel window? It is a form of bay window, which protrudes from the main wall of a building, but does not reach to the ground. Supported by corbels, brackets, or similar, an Oriel window is most commonly found projecting from an upper floor, but is also sometimes used on the ground floor. 
As seen in the 1930s, this was the home of Irving Fred and Iwan Zuella Tomes. Irving owned IF Tomes Truck and Equipment Company located at 1425 Grandview Avenue. The company, which was a local leader in its industry, sold dump trucks, concrete mixers, and other specialized vehicles. Irving and Iwan lived in Upper Arlington from 1934 until their respective deaths in 1986 and 1984. They are buried in Union Cemetery. Around 1939, Robert and Helen Royce lived in this home on Oxford Road, and his business was nearby at 2152 Riverside Drive, near the southeast corner of Riverside Drive and Treeview Road. Robert had many interests. He loved ocean cruises and traveled the world. He was an avid golfer and a member of Scioto Country Club. He loved music and loved fishing, especially in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He caught a large sailfish, which was mounted in his home. In 1956, if not earlier, Robert R. Royce and Associates, comprised of Robert Russell Royce, Lawrence M. Pleasant, and Donald G. Spees, all worked at 2142 Riverside Drive, near the southeast corner of Riverside and Treeview. On April 6, 1966, daughter Linda and son-in-law Robert, a pilot, died in a plane crash in Tennessee on their way to Augusta, Georgia to see their friend Jack Nicholas play golf in the Masters Tournament. Nicholas ended up winning his third Masters that year. Another couple also died in the plane. Linda is buried with her husband in Greenlawn Cemetery. Robert and his architect's son, Robert Richard, built most of the houses on Indian Run Drive in Dublin, where his son made his home at number 195 in 1968. Robert Sr.'s wife, Helen, died in 1972 at home at the age of 66. The next year, Robert died in 1973 at home of a massive heart attack while painting a shelf. He was 71 years old. Both he and Helen are buried at Greenlawn Cemetery. Here is another English Tudor meets Cape Cod style home designed by Royce and built in 1930. It is of a grand scale and was the home of Francis Ward and Nellie DeWitt Davis. Dr. Francis Ward Davis was a physician in private practice with a specialty in obstetrics and gynecology. He received his medical degree from Ohio State University in 1925 had his offices in various downtown locations, and was a founding member of the Obstetrical Gynecology Society of Columbus. He was on the faculty in the College of Medicine at Ohio State University starting in 1926 until he reached emeritus status in 1957. He and his wife, Nellie DeWitt Davis, lived at this address from 1931 until 1954. The families of France, Dr. Francis Davis and Dr. Wendell Postal next door, being good friends and having each bought a lot on Collingswood Road, decided to buy the lot in between their two homes and divide it. This gave each family an extra half a lot to build on. In addition, they preserved the little forest between the homes. The little forest became a favorite fort, a hide and seek location, and a doll playhouse setting for their children and the children of the neighborhood. The two mature sycamore trees in the front yard of the home were planted in honor of the birth of each of the two Davis sons. Visible over the top of the west side of the garage is a tall pine tree. The tree was planted by the Davis family in hopes it would become a sailboat mast. However, the mast was never made and the pine tree still stands were planted. 
Dr. Davis, an avid sports car enthusiast, purchased and drove a 1953 MGTD Roadster. He later sold the car to his son. Many years later, the son contacted the president resident, also an MG owner, offering to sell the car to him. The car presently resides in the Collinswood Road garage. It is said the car has never been registered to another address. Nellie Davis died in 1970 and Francis moved to Winter Park, Florida. He died in 1978, survived by a second wife, Ruth, and five grown children. Here is the home next door mentioned earlier. It offers a combination of three styles, French Normandy, English Country Revival, and Tudor Revival. Built in 1929, the French Normandy style is reflected in the cornered entryway. Royce puts a lot of effort into the entryways of his homes. The steeply pitched slate roof and scale of the home argue for English Country Revival. The mix of brick and frame hints at Tudor Revival. This Royce home has it all, and in fact, its owner, Dr. Wendell D. Postal, and Robert Royce were good friends. Dr. Wendell Postal was a prominent dentist for whom Ohio State University's dental school is named. Dr. Postal's son also was a dentist and his grandson, Herbert, is currently a dentist. This Royce home, built in 1934, showcases the Cape Cod Revival style. Cape Cod style houses can be traced to the late 1600s in New England. They resemble in form the stone fishermen's cottages of Southwest England. They were built along coastal waterways and were shaped and oriented to withstand the prevailing winds and weather off the Atlantic. The Cape Cod Revival style home was an extremely popular and affordable home in the United States from the 1920s through the 1950s. Based on the salt box type house of the early colonists in New England, the original versions had low central chimneys, but many revival style designs have end chimneys as seen here. There is usually a central entrance and a steeply pitched gabled roof, which is shingled. The windows are usually framed by shutters. This was the home of Charles Clifford Huntington. He was a member of the faculty at Ohio State from 1909 until 1943. In 1922, he was appointed chairman of the newly created Department of Economic and Social Geography. He led the effort in 1924 to establish the Geography Department at Ohio State as a separate department. Its roots were in the College of Commerce and Journalism, where early courses took on an economic focus. Also in 1924, he became chairman of the Department of Geography. He managed the department through the 20s and into the 30s before retiring from the chairmanship in 1934 and from the university in 1943. Upon his retirement, he was Professor Emeritus until his death in 1956. Another, excuse me, another fine English Tudor Revival style home was built in 1930 or 31. Note the decorative timbers, especially the timber frames of the sun porch on the west side of the home. And note the rounded window above the front entryway. This was the home of Carl Anthony and Helena R. Eberst. Beginning in the 1930s until his death in 1952, Carl Eberst was secretary and pur purchasing agent for Capital City Products Company, a manufacturer of edible oil products located at 995 Perry Street in 1938. As a competitor of Wesson Oil, its products included Dixie Margarine, King Taste mayonnaise products, and vegetable shortenings. 
In the 1920s, Carl was vice president and secretary of the Commerce Building and Realty Company, which did business with Capital City Products Company. In his early adult years, he was secretary of the Capital Motor Car Company, the local Rio automobile distributor at 32 South 4th Street. At the time of his death in 1952, he lived at 1238 Cambridge Boulevard and was president of Marble Cliff City Council. He is buried at St. Joseph's Cemetery along with his wife, Helena, who died in 1970. So we hope that you've enjoyed our tour today. You can find our History Speaks brochure and all of our many local business sponsors and individual sponsors that help make this possible at the URL shown on your screen. Our past History Speaks 2020 events are available online at uahistory.org. Author Richard Rothstein spoke to us in March about the color of law. And we recently had a presentation about the history of the Miller family and Livingston Seed Company. Both videos are available. Unfortunately, our November event had to be rescheduled to spring due to COVID, but we will be celebrating the reconstruction of our Veterans Plaza in front of Jones Middle School. Watch for details. If you are interested in the history of Upper Arlington, you can purchase our history book published in 2017 at the establishments shown. Also this year, we will be selling a keepsake ornament, the third in a series. In January of 2020, the city of Upper Arlington adopted a new city flag, and that's what our ornament celebrates. Please watch for details again at uahistory.org and on Facebook, the ornament will sell for $12. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you at another event soon.